So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, those who think that they are tall, you may just leave the talk right now. It's <laughs> really not. <laughs> wow, all this, all way out by really. Okay, so, well, this, when I talk about short, it's not physically short, but, you know, Martin Fowler in his blog post, he talked about microservices. And he said that you must be this tall to do microservices, right? So he, what he meant was that the company must have, have a product that is well-defined, has a good domain that is really well-defined out there. Right? So that is the meaning of the hype there. But for continuous delivery, it's a total different thing from microservices itself. So there's this another famous guy that I know. He's a very nice guy, chill guy. He says that you can be short and still build a spaceship. Do you know who this guy is? That's right, it's me. <laughs> okay. So, okay. okay. So yeah, I believe that everyone can build a spaceship even if you are small or short. Right, so what is this continuous delivery thing? You know, we always hear this buzzword floating around everywhere, people doing just now, Yoast was giving a talk on uh, function as a service, which is part of continuous delivery and all that. Then there's also continuous integration, continuous deployment, and all that. So what is this CD thing? So uh, what continuous delivery means is that you continuously deliver value to your customers, right? So you, or you continuously deliver the product to your customer itself. And that requires something from you as the owner itself, right? You need to have some sort of confidence. You need to be confident that your product works, right? Before delivering it to your customer. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? But sometimes the obvious is not really that obvious and I learned that through ARMY itself. <laughs> right, so, uh, so what is, what is confidence, right? So, you know, a lot of people think that confidence is about being able to do different Sort of thing. So let's, let, let me give you an example of a scenario back on Earth, right? Because we are now in outer space, right? So let's go back to Earth. Okay, back on Earth, we want to have the confidence to win wars, right? So there's, uh, there's a lot of people out there fighting wars and stuff. And generally, if you, are, if you think you're on the good side, you want to be confident to win that war and write history, right? And of course, confidence requires some sort of discipline. I learned this a lot uh, in army as well. They like to, they like to punish us if we do <laughs> something wrong, right? But I don't think, uh, I don't think punishment is a form of discipline. I think that discipline needs to come from within. You need to have self-discipline, right? You can ask the person to do one hundred push-up, and the person won't change, right? There are, there are cases like that, right? There are some people that are just really undisciplined, stubborn, and all that, and when. You need to have the discipline to do your exercises to keep yourself fit, right? You need to have the discipline to do your firing drills, safety drills, and all that drills, right? And of course, you don't just work alone in the army itself. You work with your team, right? And team confidence requires some sort of collaboration between you and body, right? So we always have this body system in the army as well, right? Uh, and of course, people have the very levels of discipline as well. So some people might fold their big shit. Some people might not fold their big shit, right? And that is, th those small little things are part of the discipline itself, right? And it also relates back to continuous delivery itself. And of course, you can't collaborate when there's weak leadership, right? You need to have a good leader, a leader who, who, is, who himself is also disciplined. Right, you, you wouldn't want to follow a leader who is like, oh, sloppy, sloppy, wear slipper, go wall, and all that, all right? Yeah. And of course, if you wear slipper, go wall, I think, <laughs> GG already, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, my final question to you here, as part of the army itself, is, are your employees willing to smash through walls with you? Right, are they willing to go beyond, are they willing to die by the side? Right, in, in the case of military. But that, that is a serious question. And if the answer is yes, congratulations, you are a good leader. Right. But if the answer is no, maybe we should go through some self-evaluation sometimes and reflect upon our own actions. So 
when building a spaceship, we want to fly, right? We need to have the confidence to fly, or else there won't be a point of building a spaceship, right? So we want to fly and soar beyond the skies, reach for the stars, and if you fail, you... I don't know. <laughs> right, so a spaceship itself consists of different parts. This is pretty obvious when you see the spaceship launch, one part drops out, the other part drops out, and then uh, that's a lot of uh, physics there, which I don't know. Okay, but there's things that, that are pretty obvious, like there's this thing called a jet, I think. Yeah, uh, so part of a jet, uh, it breathes out fire, right? Like, like a dragon, right? But in modern days, uh, it's, it's kind of cool, you know, but it pollutes the environment though. So uh, it's an essential construct. Right? We, we, there are some things in life that you need, like water, food, sleep. Yeah, I think some people don't sleep though. So uh, version control is an essential construct to your continuous delivery itself. Right? It's our first step. Right? There are also other parts to the spaceship that are not as important. Right? There's parts like, hey, let's say we can detach this fuel rocket, rocket fuel or maybe you don't need the pilot to be there. Right? These are all parts that are not essential. Right? But they're nice to have, which is the same as continuous delivery itself. You don't need to build the whole spaceship. You can build some parts of the spaceship. You can fly, but maybe not as high, but you will certainly reach somewhere. Right? Uh, so let me give you a scenario that happens on the spaceship. Right? Pretend that you're working on this cool new radar system that is so cool and nobody knows what you're doing except you. Uh, your radar system suddenly stops working after you make a code change. Like you add an additional colon and then it stops changing. It stops working, right? Because I don't know why. Right, so it's just a tiny little change there. So you know what broke it. That small little semicolon you just added, right? It's pretty simple. But the question is, how do you know that your software has actually stopped working? Well, we, we know that what you, the small change that you just made has broken, it, but how do you even know that it broke it? So, of course, we need to have some sort of maintainable test and monitoring for your system itself, for your radar system. And we don't want to just have tests. We don't want to have maintainable tests. Because I've seen people, they write lots of lots of unit tests and gives you nice numbers on test coverage. But when you, when you want to add additional things in, like a new feature, it breaks a lot of the existing unit tests. And this is what we call a high cost test. And you'd rather not have it. So, uh, you, which is a lot of unit tests, right? So uh, I myself, I don't do unit tests. <laughs> so I, I, I've got good reason for that. <laughs> so I usually just write uh, integration tests and accident tests. I, it's a personal thing, right? So uh, if you write unit tests, good. I mean, if you think it's still maintainable, well, I mean, that's, that's fine by all means. And of course, we also need to have monitoring to monitor that it went down, the service went down. And software confidence itself requires commit and testing discipline. Right, you want to make small changes and then commit it immediately. Right, you don't want to make a giant power of code and then it widens your entire scope of your change. Right? You don't know which part of it actually broke your software if the scope is too big. So that's why we always have to be disciplined in doing our commits. And other than that, we need to be disciplined in writing our tests. Right? Don't, don't just do the code and then just uh, well, there's no need test lah. Huh? Then after that, when your technical debt acts up and so on and so forth, the bugs comes in. You don't know what went wrong. You don't know if something broke or not, right? So you need to have you need to maintain that discipline to test and to make small changes, right? So like for example, I make a small change, I commit, pull, merge the changes, push. Very simple. Right, there's also other parts of the spaceship itself that are relatively important. Like, oh, pretend that this is a spaceship that doesn't use fuel anymore, right? It's so high tech, like what Elon Musk wants to do. Right, so it's rechargeable energy. And it's reusable and repeatable, right? You can use it over and over again. Right. And 
it makes things more simple, easy, right? You can just keep charging and it works and all over again. Just like a repeatable deployment process, right? We want to if you want to deploy something into production itself, we want to make it repeatable, easily repeatable, right? Or else it will be it, it will become a ritual, right? We don't want to have rituals in our deployment process and all that. And if we actually achieve it, we will no longer have any Friday nights where we sit in a circle and we start praying, <laughs> praying, praying that the code works, praying that the code for one last year ago works when you push that production button. And of course it doesn't and then your weekend is burned. And then, yeah. You, and that's basically what a re deployment ritual is. So if we, if we break down the pain, we bring forward the pain. We want to bring the, all the pain forward so that we reduce the, um, the eventual amount of large pain, right? When you want to take pain, you always take small amount of pain. So don't take one giant chunk of pain there, all right? And of course, that's, really, really nice to have. And then the next question is, hey, I'm a short person. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really just a freelancer. Or I'm really, really just a small, tiny company that nobody really knows about. So how can I do it? How can I achieve this magical spaceship thing that you just said? Well, we need to understand what are your constraints first, right? As a short person, right? There are, Varying different kinds of constraints, but let's talk about the ones that are important, the ones that everyone knows and might not want to talk about. So the first one is, where got time for bug fixes, right? We always want to push the latest, nicest features to our customers and uh, our boss wants us to do it or else he'll cut our salary and we'll be jobless, we'll be sleeping on the streets maybe taken care by the government itself. So um, we always face time constraints in delivering the product features, right? And it's, it's a very, very common thing, but it's okay. It's okay to not uh, write tests to find, to find bugs, right? I, I think it's definitely okay, right? To some extent, of course, because eventually your debt builds up. It's just like buying a house, right? You buy, you, you take on a good debt. It's a debt that, it's a form of debt that you can pay a house, right? Unless you start buying 10 cars and it, it's sort of a bad debt by then. And that's when uh, we call it a bad technical debt. All right, of course, if you don't have time to fix bugs and write tests, we still need some sort of monitoring, right? To have some visibility and insights to what actually broke the code. So, Eventually, you would want to have some testers or developers write some basic just smoke tests or integration tests, right? Just for the sake that for the long term run, where you eventually cut down a lot of lot of time. And then the next thing is, where got money? Our bank got case already, right? Look into the bank account, zero dollar. Look into the other bank account, negative one thousand dollar. <laughs> oh, but. You know, actually, I know actually some people from my camp itself, they borrow money, then borrow, what, $600 or what? Then say, ah, uh, if, I, if I borrow the money from you, uh, don't tell anyone. Of course, afterwards, the person disappear. All right, so, uh, small companies face the constraint of uh, money, right? And, and of course, if you don't have money to hire testers, well, your developers would then have to spend some time on writing a test itself, right? That's, that's one way of shaving now. And uh, other than that, you yourself can also try to write tests. It's, it can be API tests, right? Just HTTP tests, right? To test whether the endpoint works. It's not super difficult, even if you are non, if, even if you are a business person. And finally, you think like, oh crap, this giant, giant power of software thing that you just talked to me about is such a headache, right? Can I outsource it? Well, the answer is yes, you could, right? You could outsource it, just like how Uber did it. Uber, when they first started out, they outsourced their product uh, to, Bel to one of the Belgian development company. And then after that, they did the software. It's mostly for their prototype and everything. And once it's done, 
they got their money in, they started having their in-house team to build, to build uh, products, to, to have their own continuous delivery process and everything. They build their own culture eventually. Whether or not Uber has a good culture or not is a separate thing. They still have a culture, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, of course, um, I, I think that we, it's definitely okay to outsource the stuff initially, or some parts of the stuff, right? But there comes a point of time which you want to build a team. And you can't buy DevOps, you can't buy continuously, continuous delivery in a box. There's no such thing. It's not like Pipe Piper where you buy that box or cloud, I don't know what is that, the, I, I even forgot what it's called already. Yeah, and then he takes out the rabbit and everything. Right, so let's talk about some tools that can assist your small company in, uh, in building your own continuous delivery process to fly to the skies. Of course, my, one of my favorite tools is GitLab. Uh, it's pretty nice, it's written in Ruby uh, with some Go components, and uh, they're doing quite well. And most importantly, it's free. Free as in library and gratis as well. And there's also OpenShift that is built on top of Kubernetes. So if anyone of you heard of Kubernetes before? Kubernetes? Okay, a few hands, right. So Kubernetes is basically like your Google, it's by Google. It's a, a Docker container orchestration tool. And OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes, right. And with these tools, with these two tools, you can actually build a complete suite of uh, continuous delivery process, right? So there's a lot of processes that will be involved, but uh, let me show you what the basic setup is. All right, so uh, you can have, you can not have some parts, you can have some parts. So for example, if you're starting off as, a, you're just starting off with version control, maybe you just wanna go with GitLab CE. GitLab CE is the GitLab community edition. So maybe you just need that part, right? And that's it. Right, you can add on the different parts later on. So if let's say you wanna start running your uh, build runners, build testers and everything, you can add in a GitLab uh, CI runner. Right, it's pretty easy um, because you just add another deployment. I'll show you the demonstration. And of course we use Helm, Helm server, which is the Taylor, I don't know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> Taylor deploy. <laughs> So it's the help is by Kubernetes as well. I think it's uh, proudly sponsored by Microsoft or something. So in this setup here, I basically use GitLab C to accept all my version control stuff, do my builds using GitLab CI runner. Once the build is done, I commit the build. I commit the container. I upload it to the Docker Hub registry. Once it's uploaded to the Docker Hub registry, I then run through the test test pass, then I use Helm server to deploy deploy it within OpenShift itself. So all this is deployed within OpenShift. So let me show you a quick example of what I mean by that. So down here in my projects here, can everyone see, is it very small? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty small, right? <coughs> so let me zoom in. So I down here I have different projects, right? I've got GitLab. So under GitLab, I just, I add the template in. So in my project itself, I got different kinds of uh, different kinds of stuff, right? I can just add in a GitLab CE and then it opens up all this, uh, the GitLab CE itself, Post Postgres server, Redis and everything. So it's deployed already. And I've also got my runners in a separate namespace of OpenShift. So down here I've got a uh, my runner service running up, I can just easily increase the number of ports. So it's, um, I don't think load balancing is set up because it's a mini shift. So mini shift is like mini cube. So it's a mini version of mini, it's a mini version of Kubernetes. So mini shift is a mini version of open shift. Right. So um, we've got all this, this two basic stuff. So let's take a look at our pipeline here. Oh no. So down here, I look at uh, GitLab itself. GitLab down here, you can see that I've written my GitLab uh, file to my CI file. 
to run a build. So let's take a look at the build. So you can see that there yeah, is the password. Yeah, the password is hidden. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, right above here, I basically I download. I use the Heroku build pack. I build in in Heroku build pack. So what this does is the the GitLab server connect contacts the GitLab CI runner. The GitLab CI runner then contacts OpenShift to spin up a port within OpenShift itself, and the port runs Docker Git. And within the doc, Docker Git itself, it pulls the code in, and then it, it connects to a Docker service. Uh, so it's called Docker in Docker, D-I-N-D, -I -D, right? So, and there afterwards, it takes that D-I-N-D service, then pulls this uh, Herokush Hero Docker image. And then it starts building, building the image and everything. And then I run the necessary build process for my app to run up. So it's actually an, an Angular app, the build pass chunk, everything, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so build pass already. And then I then upload it to the Docker registry. So you can see down here, it has the tag here with the size, when was the last time it got uploaded and everything. So that's for my first part. So let's. Let's look back at the pipeline itself. I can run concurrent builds. I can run concurrent workers. Like for example, if I want to do code quality tests, like code climate, I can do that too. Or if I want to run tests, right, then I do it in another one. Right, so for code quality, I allow it to be failed. Right, so if code quality fails, I don't care. Right. And then afterwards, since the test passed, I deploy to staging. Right, so let's take a look at the staging server. So same thing, the, the GitLab contacts the GitLab CI runner, the GitLab CI runner spins up a port with a Alpine, Alpine latest image. And then there afterwards, it pulls, the, it pulls my image from Docker registry, from the Docker Hub registry. Then uh, everything, then I use Helm, I use Helm to deploy it to the staging server. So down here is deploying and deploy. It got deployed. And of course it filled it filled the production part, but let's not care about that for now. So down here you can see that uh, my app has been deployed to this place, which is still within OpenShift itself, which is pretty amazing. So this OpenShift thing is an all-in-one thing which you can just spin up tons of tons of ports. Right, so uh, let's so I, this was a game that was created uh, by my team. My team and I did this game during a hackathon, and it was to help people to learn sign language through games. So let's take a look at the games. All right. So there's like oh there's there's the National Day songs, and since I'm a proud Singaporean patriot, let's play this game. All right. So let let me show you how how this game works. All right. So it's so you can see that oh uh, this this lady down here is uh, gonna do some stuff right. So what I do is I I do the hand sign. I do the same hand sign as her. Then I gain points. Right. So I I gain <laughs> I I gain points for uh play, doing the correct hand sign gestures right. So this was a very simple. Uh, I use. Uh, I, I basically take use, make use of motion gestures, uh, motion detection, and then uh, blend, and then do some canvas stuff, and then all that, some math, and then that's it. Right, so it's more or less quite accurate in some sense. So that was the app that was deployed, right? which was really, it really, really seems simple. And yeah. So now we've got our stuff deploy our web app got deployed into production already so that was how easy it was to do everything right and in GitLab itself you can revert the commit and once the commit get revert you can bring back to the previous production build you can change whatever tag you want to build to, to send to production right so it's really powerful really easy to use as well and I kind of like it as well 
And once the app is deployed, what does that mean? We're in space. Yeah. So, uh, and that's pretty much about it for continuous delivery. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the application just to demo just now, uh -huh. how do you recognize the gestures? So, uh, well, it seems like you're more interested in the <laughs> app than the <laughs> actual talk itself. So, I take, let me open up the project. So, it's quite simple here in the game somewhere with the component. Let me look at the component here. Hmm. I think it's down here. So I motion calculation here. So uh, we cal we calculate the movement. So you can see that the camera itself, uh, the the camera part. Let me open up this thing. Oh wait. So this part here is uh, they are both canvases. So when you accept the image source. There's a, it's a part of HTML, JavaScript stuff. So you accept the, and then for every time it draws, it draws an image, right? So you take that image that's drawn onto the canvas, then you take, you blend it to, uh, you blend it to see what's the difference between the last and the current image, right? So you, you see that there's a difference. Let me, okay, talking is hard to show the difference. So I think I hide some stuff. Let me, uh, yeah. So down here, uh, yeah, let me just remove this thing. Then you will see what's going on. Oh no, this is deployed onto production. <laughs> so let me just solve it. So uh, I need to come. The combo is quite quick, fast, I think. Yeah, so down here, you see that, uh, you see that there's this, there's this thing here. When I move, can you see? So that, that was basically it, right? So I compare, I take the blending, I compare both of the images, then if like the black and white matches and everything, then it's okay. Then I give a score. Yeah, so it's, uh, I use some, uh, there are some custom stuff here and there, but yeah. Any other questions? Hi, yes. How do you manage credentials or secrets? Uh, Sorry? Uh, hold on. <laughs> secrets. Uh, okay. How do you manage um, secrets? secrets or credentials? Yeah. Because you are pushing things yeah. to Docker repo and then you're yeah. pulling things from from your repo. Which is yeah. Like, yeah. So GitLab itself has uh, CI. The Git, GitLab itself has uh, secrets management. And it's... Uh, the secrets management is quite simple. Down here, you can see there's a, I think it's under environment, was it? No, uh, under CI/CD. Yeah, under CI/CD, there's this thing secrets variables. And as for OpenShift, it, there's also uh, there's also secrets management. But 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 I understand what the problem you mean. But by, by here, right? You want to have a centralized place to store all your secrets, right? So if I remember cor correctly, there's this thing by, I forgot the company name. Oh, crap. Okay, there's another one. There's a Spring Cloud config server, which you can encrypt and version control your secrets as well. Spring Cloud, Spring Cloud config server, right? Yeah, there's another company that does as well, which I, which Hashicorp. Is, Hashicorp. yeah, hash, hash Hashicorp. Hash, Hashicorp. Hashicorp. You can use that to centralize your secrets as well. And that's of course the necessary encryption for your secrets and everything. 
Okay, thank you.